Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we ask that you would just let us come worship you this morning. Uh, we pray that whatever has been going on this past week, that you would just clear it from our heads, any distractions, anything that uh, the opposition is trying to get in our way uh, to, to break our confidence. We just ask that you would remove that so that we can worship you with clear consciences. In your holy name we ask and we pray. Amen. go back to school yes good good no so you want the summer to last a little longer over here I understand that well I want I wanted to ask you a question what are you scared of ghosts uh, spiders that's right the dark I understand that going back to school yeah, I, I get that. Well, we all have fears. Uh, when, I was, when I was your age, I was actually scared of heights. Uh, I'm not anymore because I had a best friend that took me through a lot of heights. So, uh, got over that. Uh, but when it comes to serving the Lord, uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and discipline. And so what that means is whenever we do something for him, uh, his spirit is the one who has the power behind that. We might be scared, but he is not. He is confident. And so when we're doing something for him, we can be confident that he will get us through it, that he will go ahead of us. And so even if we're scared of you know, the dark, if we're scared of spiders, any, any of that, we know that we can go to the Lord with it. And he will 
get us through that fear. Even if it's school, he'll, 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 he'll get us through that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you, uh, you alleviate our fears. You have a spirit of confidence, of power, uh, love, and discipline. And we just pray for all of those things now, that we would not be scared to do your will. Give us boldness. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you save, and we are thankful that you can use us uh, as a part of the salvation of so many. We pray that you would bless this offering, bless the gift and the giver, and may it do your will. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
something to be said about those lyrics. He touched me and he made me whole. Amen. He is the only one that is capable of making you whole. That emptiness that is in there that we all feel, he is the only one that can make that whole. Mm. Well, you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And let me just bring up this question of uh, calling, question mark. What does it mean to be called? Uh, well, there are different types of callings. Uh, in particular, I think when we think of the word calling, we think of a call to ministry, maybe to go into the mission field or to become a pastor. Uh, but there's many callings. Uh, some people are called to the profession they're in. Uh, some people are called to be plumbers. Some are called to be nurses. Some to be doctors or, you know, even lawyers. Uh, believe it or not, we need them. So uh, there are many different callings. And there's, there, when people try to figure out, well, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? What am I supposed to be doing on this earth? We think about calling and go, well, all right, I'm good at this, but can I really do this for the rest of my life and, and really just feel satisfied with myself? Am I really called to do this or maybe this? And, and so there's a lot of freedom in our society, especially now, to be able to pursue different callings. If you go down one path and you decide, that ah, that's not the right one, well, all right, you start making efforts to switch or do some other thing with your life. Well, when we get to calling, what happens, not necessarily when you have trouble finding it, but when you have found it, and all of a sudden things don't go right? What happens when you start getting this conflict, when you start hitting these roadblocks and you go, is the, am I really supposed to be here? Is this really what the Lord has called me to do? Is this really what I'm supposed to be doing with my life? And I want to be able to encourage us this morning. Uh, Paul writes this letter to Timothy, and he is in prison in Rome. In fact, this is the last letter we get from Paul. And so it has this undertone of Paul saying goodbye. And Timothy, he has trained Timothy up. He has basically made him essentially his protege. You, he, this is his apprentice. And he is trying, if he knows this is his last letter, there's undercurrent is he is trying to encourage him, trying to give him words of wisdom to prepare for a ministry without him. So it's no surprise that right out of the gate, Paul leaves some, has some very personal things to say to Timothy. And this is where I want to focus this morning. Let's start reading in verse 3. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you, even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. So the first thing that Paul starts out with, starts this whole letter with, is reminding Timothy, I am praying for you. Mm. That is powerful. Not just praying, not just saying, hey, I'll pray for you. He is saying, I am constantly praying for you. Every time I think of you, I stop and I say a prayer for you. You are on my mind. I thank God for your faith, and I long to see you. This, he, he tells him he misses him. Prayer is the first and foremost way that we exercise our faith. We are not willing to do it anywhere else in our life if we aren't willing to take it to God first. Like, that, is, that shows our importance. If, if it is truly important to us, we take it to the Lord first because he is the only one who is capable of making these things happen. And so Paul is, is praying to the Lord, thank you for Timothy, thank you for his faith. I long to see him. But what else? What else is he praying about? He says he is mindful. 
of Timothy's sincere faith. That's verse 5. I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you. So he's thankful that it is not only apparent in Timothy, the way that Timothy conducts himself and lives, but it is apparent that where his faith came from. He says, your faith came from your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. He knows exactly what led to Timothy becoming a Christian. And it was the, the Jewish faith of his mother and his grandmother. Normally we would expect this to come from the father. But Acts 16 gives us a little insight that Timothy, Timothy's father is Greek. And so if there's any influence towards faith, it would have to come from his mother's side. What's also interesting is that Paul himself also mentions where his faith comes from. Back in verse 3, he says, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did. He's talking about the, the Jewish faith and the forefathers and the, the people of the Jewish faith, the heroes of the Jewish faith who have led us to this point. Ultimately, he is underscoring Christianity is a legacy. He is able to have a clear conscience about what the Jewish forefathers taught as a spider crawls up my microphone. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to be distracting, but... Yeah, he's attacking me. Uh, he's able to have a clear conscience about what the Jewish forefathers taught him about his faith. He says, I can hold to this. And so he says, Timothy, you, your faith goes back generations. He goes, mine goes back generations as well. This is all part of a plan. And I thank God that you have latched onto it as well. And I pray that you will continue to latch onto it. Because this is where he's going. I pray that you will continue to latch onto it. And now he disappeared and I'm scared. Don't need to be scared. Moving on. My entire point here is you might be the only influence for the gospel in your family or your workplace. Sincere faith starts with being concerned about the faith of others and praying for them. If you want to discover your calling, it starts with having a sincere faith. Because <laughs> it, most of the time, we, we try to figure out what we're trying to do with ourselves. We're trying to figure out where to go, what the Lord wants us to do, and uh, we're still trying to live, lead a fake life. He says, I'm not going to direct you where you need to go because you're not living the way that I have already directed you to do. And sometimes in order to go forward, you have to go back. What did I tell you to do? Be faithful to that, and then I will make the road clear. And so we're pointing back at this legacy. And Paul is saying, let's look back at this legacy so that we can move forward because I'm not always going to be here. So he's building towards something. Let's continue in verse 6. For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and love and discipline. So he moves on from establishing sincere faith and he says, I need you to rekindle God's spirit within you. Look at, look at the way that word comes up. Kindle afresh. This is, uh, he's talking about Timothy's commissioning. He says, there was a time where I came and I laid hands on you and I said, you're going to go be a missionary. I declare you, you need to go do the Lord's work. Now, in any aspect, whether it be not just ministry, but our jobs, uh, there's a point where people went and got education. You know that's the entire point of getting a degree is this establishment has said and handed over some, a piece of paper to you that has said, we commission you to go do this work. We put our stamp of approval on it. And that is the same idea as doing an apprenticeship. There's a point where the person who is the master gives a stamp of approval on the apprentice. And so 
Paul is taking us back there. Now, the biggest stamp of approval you can get is the Lord's. I hope you would realize that. But he is pointing back to this commissioning where he says, Timothy, I want you to remember when I commissioned you to do this work, when I laid hands on you and sent you out to do this will of the Lord. Some time has passed, and Paul wants to remind him how he has ended up in this place. Things have probably come in and started to hit him. The, the realities of ministry and this work are starting to, to make him just, oh, man, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? It's hard. This isn't exactly what I thought it would be. And so Paul wants to remind him, and he says something that should stop us in our tracks, rekindle the flame. I get the idea of a, this picture of a campfire. This word is actually used of a, of a fire that is dying out. So if you've ever been to a bonfire and uh, you've been there the next morning and then all of a sudden it's, it's, the fire is it's just ashes. It's still hot, still smoldering, but it's ash. He says, that is the spirit in us. You need to go rekindle it. You need to go get it going again. Get that fire roaring again. You've been in ministry for a while and it is this job. You need to go back and keep making sure that this fire is lit. Repeatedly. Now, what do you do? You put more wood on. You stir it up. Start blowing on it. Chances are, if you've been doing something for a long time, you might get bored with it. Or if you have something that you absolutely love to do, there are things that you do not like to do about it. Perhaps the passion has started to wane or it's starting to lose your attention and you're starting to say, ah, maybe I need to do something else. What he's saying here is very important. It is up to us to restoke that flame. If we just let a, you know, find a fire and let it die out, it's very natural we're going to start searching for a fire somewhere else, something to give us warmth. But he says, no, we intentionally go back to this one and we keep it lit. Uh, it's interesting that I actually have a degree in kinesiology that I do not use. Uh, I might have been good at human body or personal training or physical therapy. That's what you do with that. Uh, but in terms of calling, it was a fire that would extinguish quickly if I actually tried to pursue it. It was a nice hobby. It was good for a little while. I might have even been decent at it, but that is not the calling that I was given. That is not what the Lord has set in my path. And so that fire would quickly die. Paul doesn't want Timothy to miss this. The act of making God's gift in you is like rekindling a fire. You have to feed it, stoke it. This is not passive. And so we need to intentionally feed the fire of our spirit. We need things that we can smile, laugh, have joy about. It's not all just a chore. What are the things that you love about the church, about the ministry, about the things you do? Let's lean into that. Let's get that going and get that burning again. What's great is the next verse actually mentions the spirit. Verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and love and discipline. A spirit of power, love, and discipline. Not timidity, not fear. There's a reason the spirit is equated with a holy fire elsewhere in scripture. Fire is wild. It is hard to control. It is hard to contain. It will keep you warm, but it will burn you if given the chance. You have to be careful. Are we careful with our spirit? Because it'll burn you. <laughs> 
As Christians, we have the Spirit of God living within us. Do we fan the flames of what he tells us to do, or do we quietly try to let that fire die and move on to something else? Because for a lot of us, stepping out in faith is to do what the Lord has been tugging us to do for a while is hard. It's scary. Uh, especially if it invokes changing something massive. So Paul is highlighting that the Spirit, Holy Spirit is powerful. It loves and it disciplines us. If we are truly called, we will be disciplined. We will love the work we do. And there, will be, there is power in it. He is not timid. So we do not need to be timid about doing the work that he has given us to do. It is all according to his purpose. Verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. But now, having been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. So Paul moves on and he is, he's building his case and he says this is all part of God's purpose. He lists two things not to be ashamed of. Therefore, do not be ashamed. What? Of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. He says, don't be ashamed of my imprisonment for it. Shame, I think we're all very well acquainted with this feeling of shame. It is the feeling that is usually associated with guilt. Now, why do I say usually? Well, it's meant to tell us that we have done something wrong. However, in this case, because the world rejects God and embraces sin, we're pressured into being ashamed of the testimony of Jesus and even our brothers and sisters who are suffering for it. Paul is in prison. He says, ugh. The world shames it because they want to embrace sin. And so if you are going against them, they want to shame you. And so we get this feeling of guilt, even though we, in the eyes of God, are not guilty. It's just so much easier to look the other way. Because this feeling of shame pushing through it is just, it, it contradicts everything that we feel inside of us. But Paul doesn't want to leave it there. He instead wants Timothy to join him in these sufferings. He says, not only don't be ashamed of the gospel, don't be ashamed of me suffering for it. I actually want you to join me. I don't want you to just be, okay, that's great. He says, God's method may have been shameful, but it still comes with the power of God. This is not according to our works. He makes point he makes sure to point that out. This is all dependent upon God's grace. It's freeing to know that the calling doesn't change depending on how I measure up to it. Now that said, I can still leave it. I can still burn it to the ground if I so choose. But he's saying if you're truly called to this, you're going to lean into it. This is not dependent upon you. This is dependent upon you relying on the power of God. And so we do our best because it is his plan and we just follow and obey. And so he builds up God's plan. He has saved us with a holy calling. And then he moves into this, this point in verse 9. I want to point this out to us according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted in Christ Jesus from all eternity. He points this back to legacy. Once again, 
going back all the way to verses 3 and 5. He says, not only do you have the legacy of the Jewish religion, of the Jewish people, not only do you have the legacy of your mother and your grandmother, Timothy, he says, you have the legacy that before eternity, from eternity, the Lord has set this as his plan to redeem mankind. And you are a part of it. It is no accident that Timothy ended up in the ministry. It is no accident that Paul wrote this letter to him. It is no accident that we are here reading it today. It is God's plan. And he's saying this is not just the plan when Jesus died on the cross. This is not just the plan when he was resurrected. It goes well before that. In fact, Paul has such a high view of his calling to the ministry that elsewhere in other books he calls this the mystery that has been entrusted to me. Paul took his apostleship, his calling to be an apostle, very seriously. And he said, this is a secret that the Lord has revealed to me, and it is my duty to reveal it to everybody else. <sighs> a mystery from eternity. And so in essence, while he's trying to encourage Timothy in his calling, he has linked this all the way back through all of history, through all time, through all of creation, This, precious, this is precious to Paul, and he sees it as his responsibility to steward it well. You might say, that's great. Do we see, this as, do we see our jobs as something we want to steward well, or is it just something to get us by? Do we see the things that we volunteer and do in the community as something that we want to do well? Or, yeah, that's just something that I, I feel shamed into doing. He's given us a spirit of power, of love, of discipline, not fear. But then he issues this final charge to Timothy here, right as he starts out this letter. This is the beginning of the letter. This is how he greets Timothy. Just pfft. all these personal things right in the face. Verse 12. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and the love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. So this is really what Paul is driving towards. This is his charge to Timothy. This is, he says, this is why I bring all of this up. Guard your calling. Guard what the Lord has called you to do. Whether it be ministry, whether it be plumbing, whether it be, you know, serving our community, guard it. Guard your calling with a passion because if you lose that, if that fire burns out, what is going to keep us warm? Paul is convinced the Lord can be trusted with his life, which he has given to him. As we said, this is Paul's last letter, so they very much think that Paul has death on his mind. I have entrusted the Lord until that day, and he is able to guard it. He will guard my life. You know, if he guards our life, why doesn't he guard our calling? I think he does. I think a lot of times, if we don't succeed in our calling, either it's because we give up or we torpedo ourselves. 
And so he wants to give this encouragement. Keep going. Keep igniting that fire. Keep it going. But then he says, he encourages Timothy to retain sound words. Retain good, solid doctrine. The things you believe about the Lord and the things that you believe about what you're doing, if that changes, so will the way that you do the work. And if that changes, then the fire extinguishes. But then he says, guard the treasure entrusted to him. Again, Paul giving these words, look at how high he views it. Treasure that has been given to you. Uh, some of your translations might say good things. He is talking about the gospel. He is talking about the word of God. Guard it. Because once again, if that is not precious in your sight, then you can be taken any which way. Paul considered the gospel and the word of God to be a treasure, not to lock away and be hidden, but guarded and given to those who can also be trusted with it. This next verse that Paul gives is heartbreaking, and I almost don't want to go there because it describes two and implies more that actually turned away and presumably left the faith under Paul's instruction. He was training them. He was a, they were his apprentices. And, and Paul says, verse 15, you are aware of the fact that all in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. Let's get real here. Paul is evaluating his life. He is headed towards his death. And he's looking back, reflecting on his entire ministry and the people that he has had an effect on. And he says, I have a big failure over here. These people, they did not guard the word of the Lord in their hearts. They did not keep this spirit, this flame burning. And they all left. Timothy, please, please, please guard this. Please be confident in it. Please take care of it. But also, please hold it as precious as something a joy to do, something you enjoy doing, something that you don't ever want to stop doing. Don't let it drag you down. All the way back in verse 2, he even refers to him, my beloved son. I want to ask us, what do you need to do today to stoke the fires of the Spirit in your life? What is the Lord calling you to do? It may be to become a Christian. I'd love to welcome you to the family. It may be to join our church, to get involved. I also welcome that. It may even to be just start volunteering and start getting more involved than you already are. Might even be to start a ministry. We're open to suggestions. Maybe you feel your fire has gone out and you want to pray to the Lord on how to rekindle it and keep it going. Now is the perfect time to come pray. Now is the perfect time to come to the Lord and say, I have neglected this. It has gone out. Let's get this burning again. I want to see this church just ignited on fire for the Lord. I want to see us all passionately serving him. And I think we can do it. Let's take this not as a word of shame, but as a word of confidence. And I think we should go to him with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these words that uh, we pray that you would just help this land with us in the proper way, not as a feeling of shame, but as a feeling of encouragement and even just a nudge to come back to you, to come back and figure out how to get this fire lit 
We love you so much and we enjoy and embrace the things that you are doing and we pray that you would use us to reach this, this community, this, this county, and this world for you. Do a great work in us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of commitment is hymn 435, Just As I Am. 